Stockdale and welcome to the Access to Inspiration podcast, the show where you can gain inspiration from people who may be unlike you. We hope their stories and insights enable you to transcend day-to-day challenges and reflect on what you are capable of achieving. Today on Access to Inspiration, I'm talking to Paul Rose, described as a man at the forefront of exploration and one of the world's most experienced divers, field science and polar experts. Paul spent 10 years as base commander of Rothera Research Station in Antarctica. I'm intrigued to discover about his life of adventure. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you, Sue. Now, with all your varied background, you're now a TV presenter, you're an expedition leader, you've been a polar explorer and a professional diver. What is it that is your most favourite thing to do? (laughs) <laughs> for me it's having that sense of color in my life so if i've just been at sea rolling around in heavy conditions cramped spaces lots of noise a full-on period of weeks at sea then for me it's getting back to somewhere that's dry and warm and not moving or if i've been in a hot place working in the desert or something then i'll do anything to get up into a cold place so i had this complete circle going all of the time for instance you know working in greenland working in antarctica obviously it's cold obviously things are hard work on a small expedition just to make a cup of tea you've got to go out and chip out some snow and ice and melt it in a pot and then boil it and finally you get this glorious cup of tea you can sit back in the tent and begin to live and what a thing it is to come home from those expeditions get on the train and have this guy walking down the middle of the train and say, would you like a cup of tea? (laughs) So for me, it's the variation of colour in life that it drives me. Now, I imagine that all of these experiences that you have had in your life all have an element of remoteness to them. You can't get much further extreme than Antarctica. What are you like when you're in a built-up city with no grass, skyscrapers, thousands of people around you? How do you feel being in that sort of environment? Well, normally I'm lost. I do well in flat, open spaces or underwater or featureless environments, but I get lost in cities. It's often Joel who gets me on the right direction. And another thing that happens to me in cities is I'm always wearing the wrong clothes. You know, on an expedition, you're always wearing the right clothes for that moment, something you've used for many years, know exactly how it works. You look at the conditions at sea, underwater, on the ice, you know exactly what to wear. But then in a city, maybe I've got a meeting and I'm wearing my very best suit and my sharp shoes and looking fantastic as best I can. But guess what? It's minus five outside. (laughs) And there you are hopping amongst puddles and slush and snow in your expensive shoes. So you look smart in this meeting for 20 minutes. So when you find me in a city, I'm lost and wearing the wrong clothes. And I'm imagining that you're wishing to get back out into the world again. Exactly, because it's so much simpler. And as well as the noise and the the sort of claustrophobia of urban life, it's the simple things I like. You know, polar regions tend to be white, blue, or black. And there's not many features. And similarly, at sea, you know, out on the open sea, it's a very simple perspective. And that's the thing that gives me a sense of freedom and opportunity and peace. What's it like spending 10 years as base commander down there in Antarctica I'm sure people might think that's a prison sentence. (laughs) What were some of the highlights from that experience for you? Well, the highlights are working with amazing people. You know, scientists need a lot of support staff, and approximately it's about three support staff to one scientist. That seems to be the sort of universal number that really hasn't changed because scientists need pilots, boat drivers, mechanics, plumbers, carpenters, Dentists, doctors, cooks, and poor people of all kinds. And being the base commander with this team of 100 plus people, and absolutely everybody focused on the message. There's a wonderful thing about that. It's just great. I would walk around the base sometimes, head full, trying to deliver this extensive, ambitious polar program at the end of the world's longest supply chain, and worrying almost about how it was going day to day. Being with that group of people is amazing. That's always been the highlight for me. This clarity of purpose and this simplicity of the surroundings and then the human element seems like it's a heady mix for you. 
Yes, uh, that clarity of purpose is a big thing for me. I'm very good at shutting out noise and other priorities and focusing on the main single aim because that's how we lead expeditions. We have one single aim and a careful ranking of supporting objectives. So it's very important at key times to close off those supporting objectives and get back to the main aim. Is every decision I make going to get this part of the ocean protected? Is every decision I make going to get me across Greenland? I've developed then a talent and a love for closing off noise and focusing on the single aim that matters. Well, that sounds like it's a really important thing. And particularly at this moment in the world when everybody's got an increased level of uncertainty in what they're doing, what tip would you give to people just now to help them based on your own experience? Be useful. There's something about being useful. My job description is an expedition leader. So I'm typically out. I'm not very good at just being in. So even for me, it's just going back to basics of being useful. When you're stuck in a tent in a bad storm and the storm lasts, say, a week or 10 days, and it's just you and another person in a small tent, you've got to be useful. So you may be out shoveling some snow, nip out again to check the guys to make sure the tent's okay, have a quick look at the weather and all of your equipment to make sure it's all right. Get back in, think, well, in, in half an hour, I'll start making some tea. And in an hour, I'll make some cakes or something. Do anything. Be useful. Radio back to the base at the right time and try and do useful things. Repair some equipment that maybe has come unglued. So at home here, I'm being useful. I'm keeping fit. I've bought another guitar, so I'm trying to remember all the things that I can hear myself play, but I've forgotten how to play them cooking more, doing anything that feels useful and building in interstitial fitness. Everything I do, I'm trying to do on the bike or by walking or running. And I promise myself that when I go into the office, I do 10 pull-ups on the pull-up bar that's now by the door. So it's a sense of being useful. And that's the one single word that I always remember is a sense of usefulness in what you're doing. And the other thing is just allow it to happen. We can't control at the moment exactly what's happening with COVID-19. And you can't control an enormous storm at sea. But what you can do is control what's happening on your boat or a big polar storm. You can control what's happening in your tent and how you are looking after yourself, feeding and drinking and things like this. So there is a sense of separating the things that you can't control to those that you can. I would say another facet that we've seen, certainly on the television programmes you've presented, Paul, and even talking to you today, is your really strong sense of optimism and an upbeat energy. Where does that come from? I'm not quite sure, but I've always been an optimist. I think if we really looked at it, we would say that I'm an optimist because I don't have a lot of talent. I make things happen by often a sheer force of will. People say that Paul's quite a good leader because he gets his head down and run at it, so why don't we just follow him? So I've always been optimistic when I've realised that I'm trying for something that I'm not sure I can do. I've often given myself a talk into and think I'm sure I can do it, whether it's a rock climb, skiing across Greenland, a big expedition, putting something complicated together. I've always accepted that you don't need to know everything to make it happen. You could know maybe half of it and then hope the rest will just flow as you go into it. So I think of boats at sea. There's a lot, if you go around the British coast, there's a lot of fabulous boats that are absolutely perfect. Absolutely. They've got all the best electronics. They've got best insurance. They're the most fabulous boats imaginable. But they're never doing any big journeys. They're just there because maybe the owner wants to do one more little bit to make it a bit more perfect. So you don't have to be 100% ready to make great things happen. So I learned that as a kid because I was so useless that I could still make things happen as useless as I was. So that gave me optimism. (laughs) So tell us about Paul Rose as a youngster then. What was life like for you? Were you always wanting to be an adventurer and a diver? Well, I was always very happy and uh, good mates and everything. But um, the main thing I wanted to be was out of school. I couldn't do school. I didn't like it. And along with a few of my mates, we were in a race to the bottom, really. Just couldn't do it. And I couldn't understand books. I couldn't learn from the books. Therefore, I got angry. I didn't like the teachers. 
And then me and my supportive little group of useless mates, we, we all ganged up and we were those terrible kids. So just all I wanted to do was be out. And, and with no imagination at all, I can still remember that overheated Victorian radiator next to me giving off that paint, that hot paint smell. And all I wanted to do was be out. I was good at being out of school. I was good at sports, but I could not be in that classroom. And at the same time, on television was Jacques Cousteau, Hans and Lottie Haas, and great diving adventures. And at the same, just after that, was Mike Nelson in his Sea Hunt television series. And Mike was a fictional character, but he was having amazing adventures underwater. He was rescuing pilots from crashed airplanes and men from flooded mines. All the beautiful women wanted Mike to fall, wanted Mike to teach him to dive. And I thought, that's for me. I'm going to walk down the beach with an enormous shark scar on my chest, a diving knife. All the women are going to come to me, no school. So even at 11, I knew I wanted to be a diver, but I had no idea how to get there. It wasn't in the family. That was the thing that kept me going, dreaming of being a diver, which was a bit like flying to the moon. So those television programs they gave you inspiration and they gave you a sense of direction yourself. Oh, definitely. Yes, absolutely. And it looked easy. Jack Christophe wasn't talking much about science. In fact, in those days, he was blowing up reefs to get the calypso through into the reef. He wasn't talking much about conservation. He was just underwater with his great team of men. Hans and Lottie Haas, they were working underwater with cameras and they were a couple working underwater. And Mike Nelson made it look easy. And at the end of his show, he would sit in the cockpit of his boat and he would give us a little lesson. He'd say, oh, you be careful out there in the sea, it's a dangerous place. And for all I know, he was saying, now listen, Paul Rose, you be careful. I was convinced he was talking to me. I was completely hooked. So how did you get from that inspiration on the television, disliking of school, to becoming a professional diver? <laughs> when I was 11, quite naturally, I failed 11 plus. In those days, you could take the test again at 13, 13 plus. I failed that. and. I think I was the only one that failed the thing and was on a steep decline in secondary school until our geography teacher, Mr. Gray, took us to the Brecon Beacons. I was 14 and I fell in love with the whole idea of being out in the mountains. We stayed at the Merthyr Tidfall Youth Hostel. We walked every day. I found it easy to work with a map and compass. I had no idea I was doing trigonometry or even mathematics, come to think of it, but I had a feel for it and I had a feel for good safe routes and descents. I was great in the water. Uh, the whole thing of communal living in the youth hostel appealed to me. And I still remember those days of peeling potatoes into a bucket on the step of the youth hostel in the rain, thinking, wow, this is for me. And the days high on the hills when Mr. Gray was praising me, saying, wow, you're doing great. And I, I was far too stupidly proud to ever thank him or react properly to that. But I did enjoy it. And I also enjoyed some of the kids at school that were cruising school and passing all the exams. And I was happy to see them having an absolutely terrible time in the bad weather in Wales. So it did me good. I was succeeding at something. You've also given us a sense of that illustration of your feeling of usefulness. Yes, usefulness. I was there. I was in my place doing good. Got back to school and with the energy of having a great period in Wales. In those days, you could leave if you passed something. So I managed to pass metalwork O-level. And that remains my highest academic qualification to date. I'm very proud of it. So then I could leave. I got an apprenticeship at Ford Motor Company as a tool maker. I loved every minute of it. I was earning money, learning from great people. And there, not only was there a group that were climbing and doing all these other great things, there was a diving club. And I learned to dive I'm at the Ilford British sub Aqua Club. And I doubled up the classes at Walthamstow so I could do two classes at the same time and pass out quicker. Finally, in Easter 1969, I was down at Portland Bill for my first ever dive. And even now, after a lifetime of diving around the world in most remarkable places, when people ask me what's my favourite place to dive, I always say Chesil Cove at Portland. From what you're telling us, Paul, it seems like curiosity and observation are two critical skills that you have had to have for your career. I'm wondering what are the other characteristics that you've been able to bring to your life as an expedition leader? I like to simplify things. And there's something about meeting scientists, a team of scientists or individual scientists, 
with a very complex, risky hypothesis, a science plan that is basically sometimes a set of equations or some ideas or a big pile of old science papers and turning that into icebreakers and helicopters and divers and climbers and boats and making it work in the field. I love that. I really like to get that and make it work. It, the same part of my brain that enables me to deliver science projects is the same as presenting television because I'll meet all kinds of fabulous people leading brilliant lives that I aspire to. But we've only got maybe one minute 30 for that little section <laughs> on the television. So I'm thinking to myself as I'm walking along with them, holy smokes, how do we take this brilliant piece of work and reduce it into one minute 30 while we're walking through a wood or something. So it turns out I've got quite a good talent for that. So I like that. It's my strive for a simple, well-focused life seems to come from that, that I can take a complex thing and I enjoy the challenge of turning it into something that's simple to understand or deliverable practically with field work. Thinking about today's world, the environment's quite a different place, I'm sure, than what it was in 1969. What differences do you see today and what do we as society need to do, do you think, to preserve it? The biggest difference, I think, between my early years and now is we have lost our contact with nature. We have a very strange relationship with nature, it seems, where I keep getting the sense that people feel we are not part of nature. We carry on with our lives, our urban lives, where you could be completely remote from natural effects. You can eat any food you like at any season. You're always at the right uh, place. You can just cruise along, have a happy life, and nature takes care of itself. Well, this recent crisis has brought to life that we've got a very disruptive relationship with nature and we need to get it back. And I'm optimistic, no surprise, that this will be the sort of springboard for a better relationship because the only real long-term vaccine against future pandemics is to protect our biodiversity. And unless we do, we're going to fall into another one. So this is an optimistic period for me, as hard as it is to say. So yes, in my life, I've seen a change in the way we accept nature. I've seen a lot more understanding. Who's ever seen such a level of awareness? I mean, I could go into any school and the children know about climate change, plastic pollution, overfishing. Young ones really get it. There's a, such a high level of awareness. But now we're in a new phase, and that phase is all about taking action. And I think that smart leaders, smart influencers, and smart businesses are going to use this moment in history to regenerate our relationship with nature and protect us for the future. So it's about how we integrate the two things together rather than having them disparate. We need nature. It doesn't need us. Well, that's true. So in the situation when you're out in the middle of nowhere, in one of those remote parts of the world, I'm imagining a lot of the time you are alone, even although you're part of a team. What goes through your head? I just keep myself together by being focused on the single aim. Sometimes if I'm with a small team, you know, guiding a team across Greenland or guiding in the mountains, or at the moment we're moving all of the expedition plans, jogging it back one year or maybe even two years. So it's a sense of keeping on the mission keeping on that single aim. That's how I keep myself together. And I also keep myself together by being physically active. I'm really good at what I call sort of secret exercise. If we're at sea and we're moving around, there's lots going on on the expedition boat, three or four dives a day. It's all action. Then when I'm up and moving around the ship at various places, I'll have a key spot where I do my sit-ups. I'll have another spot where I do my pull-ups, another spot where I do push-ups another spot where I pick up some weights. And as I move around the ship, I do that sort of secret exercise. And there's lots of people that have worked with me that know that uh, it's a good idea to have some secret exercise. And that's what I'm doing here at the moment, stuck at home. So I keep myself together by having a simple challenge, like a piece of music or reading something inspirational. Or that little bit of exercise goes a long way. So what would you say to our listeners who may be listening to your story, Paul, and wanting to be doing something more adventurous themselves. How would you encourage them to get started? Well, normally I use the great H.W. Uh, Tillman line, and that is, put your boots on and go. People used to write to Tillman and ask him, well, oh, you've just come back from Patagonia, fantastic, or you've just done a great journey. Can we join the boat? Can we do this? How do we do these things? 
And in the end, he made up these little postcards and it just printed on it said, put your boots on and go. And I, I sometimes paraphrase that and say, the best thing to do is get going. Don't be the person with the beautiful boat tied to the dock that isn't quite perfect. Don't be that person that has all the world's best equipment from the outdoor shops, and yet it never really goes very far. You're better off going. You know, Take the risk and just go. Call in sick from work. Disappear. Go and do it. But here we are, stuck. We can't put our boots on and go. So I would say use this time to discover a purpose, and whatever purpose that might be, then follow it to your heart and accept the risks. It might be financial risks. It could be reputational risk. But there's something in you that drives you to do this. And when you found that focus, don't take your eyes off it and make it happen. Wow, I'm sure that's motivated our listeners to get going, Paul. It's been fantastic to speak to you today. How can people find out more about you and your adventures and projects on the internet? Great, thank you. Yes, I've got an active website, which is paulrose.org. And I'm very busy on social media, like most of us, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So, yes, sir, it'd be great to see you there. Well, wasn't it fantastic to listen to Paul Rose and to hear his positivity and optimism about life? That's all for this series of Access to Inspiration. Please do get in touch with us and leave your feedback. You can go to our website, accesstoinspiration.org, and leave us a message there. We will be back soon to bring you more access to inspiration in a few weeks' time. Look forward to speaking to you then. Mm-hmm.